All right, then, guys. So to start with, what I will do is I will go over what the MSI Coach Development Program is. So I'll share my screen. So the MSI Coach Development Program. What is the MSI Coach Development Program? Free program to help develop coaches and what to coach and how to coach specific to their age group and team. So we will have one online weekly live training session and what to coach and how to coach it, followed by Q&A at the end of the session. There'll be recorded training sessions which are available to you online. So the recorded sessions on how to how to coach what has been taught in the online sessions. Session plans and curriculum, a curriculum and session plan will be sent out to all coaches every week. In the mentorship group, any coach that would like to be a part of the mentorship group is able to and will have access to live sessions and additional small group meetings. So myself, if you want to email me uh, to join the mentorship group, please feel free to do so. Uh, my uh, title and email is on the website. If you go to About Us, you can find me. So fire away for that. Today is a one-off because we are meeting on a Tuesday. Obviously, yesterday was Labor Day. It will meet weekly on Mondays, uh, and it will be uh, at this time every week, 6.15 to 7.15. We go all the way through to November, where we will uh, finish off with. And here's a quick weekly calendar. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If you, fit, if you would like to join us on those days, that's when the mentorship program will be. Okay. Any questions so far, guys, before we swiftly move on, as they say? Nothing here, Benji. Thanks. Not for me. Good to go. Good to go. Brilliant. All right, let's go. All right, so session number one. And because we have a, a fairly small group today, guys, please feel free to jump in any time, uh, add comments, concerns, or questions that you have. Uh, like I say, we will uh, move through this. Uh, together. So MSI Coach Education, the what of football, part one. So what is football or soccer? How do we define it? Football or soccer is a game with two teams trying to score one more goal than the other. Question, so how do we then teach football? We must define the parts that makes the game of football whole. Very simple. Okay, so quick task to start off with, and we will do this for two minutes. What is objective in football and then what is subjective? If you guys have attended the MSI Classic course, this may be repeating it, but it's a good refresher. It's useful for us for the rest of the session to, uh, to have this to move forward. So what is objective in football and what is subjective? I'm just going to pull this up here, which is the chat box. And what you guys can do as an example, just write this in here, objective. But there are goalposts. Subjective, as an example, chickens can play. So two minutes, at the end of two minutes, just uh, enter your message in to the group chat for everyone to see, or feel free at the two minutes end uh, when we say, uh, you can just answer it out loud. I have no problem either way. Yeah, absolutely. Objective field size, line markings. We are playing 8v8, 100%. It's a team sport, absolutely. Keep, uh, keep firing away in there, guys. Subjective penalties. Don't know about that one, Caroline. Could, would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on that, Caroline, with, with penalties? Either penalty kicks or being penalised for a foul? What, what did you mean by that one? Sorry, I was thinking of just like if it's too rough getting pushed or tripped or that type of penalty. 
Do you, well, yeah. do you know what? It's a really good point because they the ref. Because you get me on a tangent talking about referees, but the referee, ch the referees, and the, the referee association worldwide, they change the uh, they, they change the rules every year. So it is kind of subjective to your point about what is allowed versus what's not allowed. So. I would, uh, yeah, I, I think that's quite a good one, actually. I, I was going to say offsides. <laughs> well, VAR as well, but no, off, offsides pretty objective, but in the, the context of uh, yeah, in the game currently, it's a little uh, between the lines. But it is objective, is offside. But so laws of the game would be very much objective. That's a good one, Mike. Subjective winning is everything. I like that, Mark. Players dribble, pass, and score with their feet. Yeah, very much so. Very objective with these. Any of us, guys? 30 seconds and we can just move on. Goalie can use their hands. 100% they can. All right, then. Let's keep moving forward. Okay, so reason for that exercise. For us to be able to teach football or soccer, we must be able to clearly define it. So the starting point of the game is game moments. So you can unmute yourselves for this, and then we can obviously chat about it as we go through. But do we agree that there are four game moments? This is objective. Attacking, transitioning to defend, defending and transitioning to attack. Thoughts, feelings, concerns? I, I agree, Benji. Yep. I'll buy that. Perfect. Okay. Um, it is obviously objective um, because these are moments that are clear. One team has the ball or one team doesn't have the ball. So one team is attacking and defending. And there are two moments when the, the when one team has either lost the ball or won the ball back. So these are very these are four clear pillars for us to build how to teach within. Okay, so game principles. So building, creating for attacking, pressing and recovering for transitioning to defend, and then pressing and covering for defending, building and creating for transitioning to attack. Anybody have um, an idea or an area of input why we have structured it like this? Maybe because players are used to being a particular position and thinking that, oh, I'm a, I'm a forward, I'm always on offense. I'm okay, a... so, that, so, so that is a fantastic point. Um, it's, sorry, Caroline, right? Yes. Caroline. Fantastic point, Caroline, because when we are playing a game, and you guys mentioned that it's a team game, we are either attacking as a team or defending as a team. Now, the game principles would be as a team, we are now building up the attack to score, uh, sorry, building up the attack to advance the ball at the field, or we are creating opportunities to score. Even if we play, let's say, quote unquote, as a defender, it's bad terminology because you are, let's say, a centre back or a number five, you are not a defender when we are attacking. So Caroline's point is a superb one that we are building up the attack as a player, um, let's say, in the first line, the second line or the midfield line, uh, where, where the players play in the middle, you are still building up the attack. And then obviously the players that play up front or the number nine, they, they are then looking you know, to try and score. But when we are defending, the game principle is pressing. So you are no longer a longer a be poor uh yeah poor language to call them a attacker because you are defending but you are defending as a forward player and by either pressing or covering so it's a, a really good uh, example there caroline of why we would define it from game moment to game principle so uh, thank you for sharing that okay and lastly team tactical principles within the game principles so we still have building and creating, pressing, recovering within our uh, yeah within our game moments. But why have we put question marks here for team tactical principles? Anybody want to have a go? I 
think it's about as a, as a, how. Go, sorry, please go go ahead. Sorry. It's a question of how you start building and how you create and how you start pressing. Yep, superb. Can, and, and sorry, because I can't see because it's in presenter mode. Is that Mark? Yeah. It's no longer the act of doing it, but how do you do it? Yep, superb, Mark. So this is why objective and subjective is important. Because as Mark mentioned, it's the how now. The what is the game moment and the game principle. Now, how you do it is down to the subjective application of the coach. Now, our, our dear friend, Mr. Greg Berhalter, uh, as we saw the other night, he decided how he was going to play against Canada uh, was by sticking to a plan uh, that was going to uh, you know, build with one holding midfielder and two attacking midfielders over the ball. So that was his subject to application. Now, the Canadian head coach, he decided to play with five players in the back, four players in the midfield line, and one player as the, the lone forward player. That was how he was going to defend, by pressing and covering. So, as Mark very well points out, it is the how. So, team tactical principles is the how. Now, with what you guys have, and we will continue to go over this in the presentation, how we will play is based off the kids that we are working with. And look at that in the training session as well. We are trying to keep kids in the sport. We're trying to develop them with basic decision making. So how we do that is by playing small sided games and activities to bring these things out. So anybody have any questions so far, guys? And uh, by the way, fantastic responses and contributions to uh, the presentation so far. If not, we will keep going. Okay, superb. Okay, so now, because we have talked about the objective uh, moments in football, we're going to talk about what the theory behind this is. So football actions theory and its implementation. So game moment, game principle, team tactical principle. So football actions to occur, there must be a clear reference point on the principle and team tactical principle you are asking of the players. So the game moment is attacking, game principle will be building, the team tactical principle will be playing forward passes to break the opposition line. Now, communication. Communication is the interaction between the team and players and the opposition. And it's either verbal or non-verbal. So the team and players with the ball, they're building up the attack, and the opposition are pressing the ball against the team which is building. The reason that it's verbal and non-verbal is that we are interacting with each other as an example in the game by asking for the ball to be passed in the team. However, non-verbally, we are showing our body position with the correct foot for the ball to be played to. That's why it'd be a non-verbal uh, moment of communication. Also, along that line, the team with the ball, if the player is being pressed, the player that is pressing against the player that has the ball, now that's communication, interaction for that player to move the ball away from the player that is pressing. Communication is of the highest order in football and in soccer because without it, we cannot make decisions and then we cannot execute these decisions. So there has to be interaction and communication for a football action to occur. Anyone have any questions so far? No. No. Perfect. We'll keep going. Okay. So communication. Who? Team and players. Against who? Opposition. A decision making. So how to carry out the tactic based on the given communication. So the game moment is attacking, the game principle is building, team tactical principle, build away from our goal, play forwards to break the lines of pressure. If we cannot play forwards to break the lines, move the ball until we recognize the key to do so. So let's look at a quick clip of decision making. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just gonna pause it there, guys. So the first 30 seconds of that clip there, the interaction, was there a lot of attacking or defending, or was it a lot of transitioning? Transitioning. Yep, correct. And why was that, Caroline? They didn't really get out of midfield. Yeah, and the ball they were was trying to decide down. how to get out of midfield. Yeah, <laughs> yeah precisely. Ball was bobbling and bouncing, didn't really know how. No space, no time. There was no clear control of the ball. Um, so Man City did very well from transitioning to defend to now attacking. Now, we talked about game moments there. But then it wasn't really attacking or defending. It was transitioning. Now, my question is, how are Man City set up and how are Tottenham set up? So what are the game principles that you think are going to occur now? So maybe we can go on. sorry go, go ahead sorry yeah i assume man city is just gonna look to attack somehow right and look for a way to move the ball forward fantastic yep so you are correct and that uh is that mark to answer that it's mike sorry mike mike you obviously answered that mike so you mentioned the game moment they're attacking correct and you said looking to advance the ball forwards so what would then be the game principle so the game moment is attacking what would the game principle be for man city by advancing it forwards. Well, I, I, I guess he'd look for a, an open player, right? Uh, yeah. open, open player upfield. If he doesn't have one, try to swing it to the other side of the field. Yeah, well, perfect. I mean, that's a fantastic answer. So to Mike's point, the decision make, making would be find the open player to move it upfield. If not, switch it. So Mike's a step ahead of us. He's talking about decision making. The game moment is attacking. The game principle will be building up the attack. And the decision making would be find the open player, move the uh, switch to the, the point of attack, as Mike mentioned. Ooh, I start from the beginning again. So I'll just move it here to where we were. So there you go, Mike. Couldn't move it to the open player. They've switched the ball. Now they're trying to advance it up the field again. So with that being said then, with that being said, guys, and because Mike was a step ahead of us about decision-making, building, this is the uh, the game principle. Play forwards, we cannot play forward, break lines, move the ball until we recognize the cue to do so. That is attacking, okay? Anybody want to have a go at what Tottenham were doing there? What was their game moment and what was their game principle? cover all the players and shift left and right accordingly they only left one guy open at the very very top perfect yeah yeah but great great answer so would were, were, were tottenham let's say for the majority of the time pressing covering or was it a little bit of a mix of both covering yeah covering so they were protecting the spaces so we'll actually we'll go back to that there they kept really compact and stopped the space in the middle they were covering the space. They weren't stepping out to press. Where they stepped out to press was in wide areas. So there was a, there was more reward for them to go and step. And again, there, as you as you correctly stated, they're covering these spaces in here. So that is the game principle um, but within defending that they're using. And the decision making is as it travels wide, they step to press and they uh, close the space between the lines in here to make sure there's no space to play. So well done, guys. Su superb start. Okay, so decision making as we've gone over. Now, execution of decision. Execution of decision. There are four space time characteristics position, moment, direction, and speed. Now, the example that we're going to look at is the position of Fernandinho 
playing as the number six. So Caroline, we're going to go back to your point. Playing as a number six, whilst as attacking and building. So the body position of Fernandinho can see the ball, the opponent's goal, and where to play forward. So that would be the position. The moment would be as the ball is uh, is travelling forwards to receive, or from the goalkeeper. The direction how he's going to receive is going to be forwards, and the speed we would hope it would be as quickly as possible. So let's watch this clip. I'm just going to pause. Oops, sorry, guys. I'm just going to pause it there. Let me get to the, the bigger writing. So Fernandinho's field position is behind Spurs's midfield line. His body position is also allowing him to see the ball carry and the next space to play forwards into. because he does such a successful job at that, he's then able to play forwards. So how he executes his decision is based off his position, the moment to receive the ball, the direction and the speed. Okay. Okay, so execution of decision, position, moment, direction and speed. All right, guys, perfect. Anyone have any questions about that before we move on? I've got a question, and admittedly, it's been 20 years since I was playing soccer. Um, I don't remember learning with sort of this terminology. Is this more just for us as a coaches to understanding, or are you expecting us to be teaching the kids these terms and sort of this? No. So, so this this is purely this is purely for the coach, um, and 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 the reason that we are breaking it down like this is to be able to have a foundation to be able to coach with. Um, the, the 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 reason it will make more sense when we go into the session, Caroline, okay. is that we always will refer back to communication, decision making, and then execution of decision. So now, to, to to answer your question, we will look at the building session that you guys have either will either be starting this week or already started. Did the so as a quick question to the group, have a have, have you guys uh, ran a train, ran any of these training sessions yet, or gone over them with your teams? Yeah, we did um, last Friday. We had our first session. Perfect. No, we got hit by Ida. Yeah, not yet. We have our first practice tomorrow. Okay, super. So this well, this is good. So obviously we can go over this for for tomorrow. Then, Caroline, had you carried this out with with your team? If not, it's completely okay. Just we tried. Fair. It was. I, I think the first drill went better. The second one was a little chaotic. Okay, good. Now that's that's good. You've said that, Caroline, because that is something that uh, that should make sense and for a specific reason. So obviously, the first stage play. How did how did you guys do? How did your guys do with play, Caroline? Did you, what what did you do for play? Did you do two groups, one group? How did you do it? Uh, the first one we did everyone, and then as kids kind of showed up, we threw them in to the mix. Awesome. And how, how did it go? Great. I think they're all just having fun running around. Perfect. Awesome. Right. Most important thing, that's, that's fantastic. Okay, so the, ne the next stage, the 2v1 activity. So, Caroline, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll keep using you because obviously you, you've done it. H how did it go and how did you find the activity for the kids within 2v1? Uh, we didn't do a 2v1. Okay, what did, what did you guys do? We did the we did the the two drills that you showed us at the um, at Julius West. Okay, perfect. No, no problem. That's fine. That that, that works. Um, what age group did do you have, Caroline? I've got eight year olds, third grade. Oh, okay, perfect. That's fine. Yeah, well, that, that would make sense then. That's great. Um, so what we'll do though, obviously, because this is with with fourth grade and above, we can still yeah. go through this with with two v one though. And this is a question to all to, to, to all you guys. What why is two v one and we have the communication there, two players versus one player. 
why might may this be more successful than let's say 3v2 or 4v3 any uh, any thoughts or feelings on that yeah so the kids get more ball time more touches yep so more contact time with the ball and there's more opportunities within 2v1 to make more what more space Give some more space or so we talked about communication being obviously the highest order so once they're communicating, interacting, they're going to make more what within 2v1? Stuff like that. Right. So they're going to have to be able to communicate. Like, when you're good at the board, decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So because the communic decisions are based off the communication interaction, they're going to make more of them because there's less players, there's less interaction. And the same would then go for execution of decision. So it's 2v1. So create depth and width, so create space, as you've said, Caroline. And then place the highest player to play forwards, place the open player, move the ball away from the opponent, play backwards to restart uh, the build. Now, the execution decision will be passing to the correct foot, driving into the open space, and receiving on the correct foot. So what do we mean by that, passing and receiving to the correct foot? Any anyone can have a go. Right. And then they're gonna put this machine up to your feet. Right. So you're talking about like lefties or righties, like you're well the side of the field you're gonna be on. So as as an example, if the defender is stood on the right side of the player, what foot are we going to pass to? The one away from the wow. defender. Perfect. Yeah. So that would be the correct foot, right? So how we execute the decisions will be based off the communication decision making. When we have space with the ball and there is no defender around us, how are we going to execute that decision? So we, we can use the position, moment, and direction, speed reference again. So there's there's lots of space. There's no defender. The goal's in front of us. So the position, we're in front of goal. The moment we want to go and score, the direct the direction would be where? To goal. To goal. And then the speed would be at what? As fast as you can dribble. fast as you can dribble. Perfect. So based off the communication, decision-making, then the execution, this is how a logical order is then established within, let's say, this 2v1 activity. Anyone have any questions so far on the activity in general, guys? Perfect. Let's move on. I, sorry, Benji. The, no, the, objective, the, the objective of these is to just get to the goal line. Is that what you're looking to do? Yeah, perfect. So it's, just, yeah. It is, it's literally a... Uh, a grid where you just have to cross the end line here. So yeah, that, that very much is the objective. Yes. Thanks. No problem. Uh, so are we just to make sure I'm I'm reading the graph right? So we've got a square, the defenders at one corner, the the attack starting at two opposite corners. Yeah. Is the defender's decision which player? Does he want to press the ball? Does he want to cover the, well, the second well, person. Well, that's a great point for defending. I mean, what What do you think? Well, I I guess it, are the instructions to the attackers. You have to pass and get over the end line, or it's just as long as you get over there. As long, yep. Yeah, as long as you get over there. So the defender, obviously, they are they are uh, they're one down. It's just themselves. And your point is a good one, which is why I've said it. So the objective for the defender is to stop the opponent doing what from getting to the end getting to the end yeah so how they then do that well mm -hmm. if they just go and press the ball every time what's going to happen they'll pass and they'll just pass yeah so maybe they have to defend the space and it make it more difficult for the uh, the player with the ball so mm -hmm. it, it creates a problem indirectly for the defender and you'll find that you maybe uh, develop better defenders because they're always a uh, numbers down so i'd say uh that's that's one where it, it could uh, have a, an indirect effect for the uh, defending team. Okay. Anyone else, guys? No 
Okay, perfect. All right, let's go to the the 2v1, 3v2, and 4v3 building game. So quick question, why is the communication either 2v1, 3v2, or 4v3? Anyone have a, an idea? So the defenders have to communicate who which player they've got. So you don't you don't have two players marking up the same attacker and leaving yep. someone open. So, so that, that's that's one. But why for, and then build on build off build off that point, Caroline. So why is it also increasing the numbers for maybe building as well? What what does that do for the team with the ball? Well then they need to know who's open. So yeah, correct. Yeah. Say, don't 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 give it to me or yeah, exactly. Or so then with so then within the decision making, so we've created depth and we've created width. Right. We are either going to play to the highest play, play forwards, and if we can't do that, we want to play to the open play. So why does this increase the difficulty of it if we increase the communication? Well, if there's more people, then there's more people to listen to, to have to decide between. Yeah, and I, well, listen to and look at, right? So increased communication means more what? More decisions. More decisions to be made, exactly. And then there's more, more different, there's lots of different ways of executing that decision. So based off that little reference we've created there, why... Would it be, let's say, a bad example or a bad training exercise to start off trying to teach 11 v 11 to kids that have little experience playing the game? Overload. Yeah, over overload, exactly. So if we overload the players, well, there's, that's not a problem. But if we overload them to a point where there's no comprehension, it's pointless. So then we would start layering it back. Well, they can't understand 11 v 11 maybe not even 9v9, 8v8, 7v7, maybe we can teach the game at 4 versus 3 or 3 versus 2 or 2 versus 1. Now, let's say your players get really good at 2v1 quickly. How do you then overload them a little bit more? Go on to 3v2. 3v2, and they get really good at that, then 4v3. And then the same decisions... And execution of decisions would then be, yeah, would then be used, but it'd be different off the uh, the given communication. So good stuff, guys. Well done. A any questions on on that? The stage, uh, the the building game. Nope, makes sense. Nothing here. Perfect. Okay. So the next one. Four v three. Three v two. Sorry, 4v3, 4v2, and then a 3v2 game again. This time, the activity is similar, but why have we done it the way that we've done it? Now, this is the question that you guys have answered already, but in, instead of making it 2v1, we've made it 3v2, 4v2, and 4v3. Now, the end goal or the end game for the, the players that are really starting to get it is still 4v3. But why has the exercise changed with going from 3v2 to 4v2? Well, the, the advantage has changed, right? You have more of an advantage with the, uh, the 4v2. Exactly. Creates so, more openings. And... Yeah, perfect. So... Within four within four v two, you have a bigger advantage. Within three v two, you have less of an advantage. And then four v three, it's still that is the highest level of overload for what we're trying to achieve. So if your players start to get, uh, yeah, if they if they start to get uh, the three v two game or the four v two game, you can then again progress it to four v three. So that goes without saying. Any questions for that, guys? Nope. Perfect. Okay. And then the final phase, the game phase, this is where we evaluate the session and then see if the players uh, achieve building up the attack. Okay. Perfect. Anyone have any questions? I 
I think my question is just understanding the difference with the age groups, because I, I know I couldn't make the, the five o'clock session. Mm -hmm. So what, you, what you've got over here is designed for the four, fourth grade and up. Yes. Is it yeah. different different drills that I should have been doing with my third graders? Well, so with the, with the third graders, we've based it from 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3. So that that's where, and that, that's a good, you know, uh, reference again. 1v1, 2v2, 3v3, that is what first, second, and third grade can understand, right? That is in within their comprehension, and that's their last interaction, so they can make more decisions and more executions. And that's obviously because they're kids. Now, the older they start to get, the more complex it starts to become because we want it to get to the final point of looking as much like 11 v 11 as possible. So that's why the younger ages are focused on small side games. The older ages, it, it gradually progresses to 11 versus 11. Uh, so, yeah, did, did that answer it, Caroline? Yes. So it's, it's basically the same sort of mini scrimmages just with even sides instead of the Perfect. unbalanced. Okay. Um, quickly, Mark, Mark, what I'll do is I will link this. Uh, I'll link the page here. I already found it. Oh, you did? Perfect. That's great. I'll put it in there for you, for the other guys as well. Okay, guys, well, look, that was uh, shorter than expected today based off, you know, the in the interaction that we had and obviously the, the information that we got through. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, I hope it was useful. I hope it was helpful and a, a good first session. Like I said, we want to build off this every week. So the online sessions will reflect uh, what we are doing on the field. Also keep further in our knowledge of, uh, of what to teach and then how to teach it. So I, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, appreciate you jumping on and I will uh, see you next week. Thank you. Benji, thanks to you, man. Really, uh, this is this is wonderful that you you all put this together and that you're running it. Uh, it's, it's it's very needed on my end. So uh, I'll tell you, it's very much appreciated. Thanks. Oh, my, my pleasure. And like I say, we really want to keep you know supporting you guys as coaches. And uh, like I say, all I hope is that it is useful and it can be applied, and that we can keep supporting you guys as much as possible. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, guys. Take care. Great.